I wanted to give you a bird's eye view of what I have been working in the last few years, three, four years. Uh, ever since the pandemic started, you know, I kind of decided I will look at these sort of connection areas of music with other uh, fields of study. Um, and then uh, these are actually some of the topics that I have taught in school. So not college, um, but uh, school, primary, middle, and high school. I have a couple of schools that invite me um, to just talk to the kids every other week or you know, whatever frequency works for them. So I always pick a topic that excites me um, um, on one hand and never excited me on the other hand in, in some other lifetime and see if I can marry the two. So I found, you know, like I started, music seems to be so correlated with so many things. So I could pick these subjects. I have topics in math and engineering naturally because I have training in it. Uh, biology and sports uh, and even defense one or two topics because I want to stretch myself. I don't know anything about these things. Um, language is uh, part and parcel of what we do, right, as Indian musicians. Um, so language is a natural fit. In fact, I would say language is a very uh, nice topic to zoom into. That's what we'll do today. Um, and the culture and language go hand in hand. Um, performing arts is an extension. It's sort of the uh, uh, it is it is the biosphere of where we live in. As musicians, you have to collaborate with other performing artists. Um, uh, and nature and people, food, yeah, uh, not not just a subject of um, you know um, music pairing with foods. You know, that's a thing in restaurants. You know, if you play this kind of music, this music, this food tastes good. But no, it goes beyond that. Um, so that was actually a couple of nice, interesting topics I found. So anyway, today is language. Um, and um, that, is, that is a lot of scholarship in language. You know, it's mind boggling because language is something uh, without, like I said, without being aware, we are all scholars of language. Um, you know, so if we think about anything we are thinking using language most of the time, right? Uh, let me think about it. What are we doing? Like maybe we don't do anything for a few seconds and then we actually have to do some thinking and that's usually verbal. Um, of course, there are some of us who think in other ways. Uh, so that leads to theories of languages, uh, multiple intelligence theories in education and a lot of other fancy ideas. But at the end of the day, when I say language, I mean natural language, you know, Tamil, Kannada, Hindi, English, and so on. Um, that's really sort of the biggest invention of humanity. It's, it's uh, helped us, uh, um, or it, we find ourselves where we are because of language, right? Um, that's a list of features uh, that uh, this uh, linguist named uh, Charles Hockett came up with. Uh, it's a very long list. I have cho I've chosen a few of the um, features of language that he talks about. <clears throat> So these are sort of like the top 10 um, in, in my uh, reading of Hockett, right? Uh, species specificity, and I mean, these are all, of course, uh, for the linguists, this may be very obvious. Um, I just want to spend like a second or two seconds with each one of these bullet points. This is to establish, okay, in a sort of a um, academic way, uh, what, what makes language, right? Uh, what are the, uh, maybe not minimal set, but some of the things that a language usually has as features, right? So um, what is species, species specificity? Um, so it, it is like there is no other species in the world that speaks Bahasa. Um, okay, so you shouldn't say that is Indonesians. They are humans, okay? But you can also speak Bahasa if you learnt it. So that brings us to the next thing about uh, uh, language, which is that I could only speak in Tamil uh, till I was 12 years old. Um, I could not speak English because nobody around me spoke English. On, and my dad really wanted me to speak English, but <laughs> there was no incentive. So I learned English and eventually, like, I can now speak in English, right? Um, so it's uh, culturally transmitted. I was not born with the, with the skill of uh, speaking English. What specialization is, um, here it is um, adaptive specialization, the body. We have an apparatus that lets us speak um, in any language. Um, and that's called the vocal apparatus. And I mean, this is again biology. Um, semanticity is that there seems to be an inherent need to find meaning. Okay, uh, That may be also uh, sort of a, um, 
uh, it, it is a predicament of the entire species to find meaning in everything. But language's uh, main feature seems to be in assigning meaning to things. Okay, uh, uh, arbitrary. So this is arbitrary. Whale, whale is a big, big, big animal, and that fish there. Humu humu nuku nuku pua. It's a very small fish. So you see how arbitrary it is that a big animal has a small name and a small animal has a big name. That's why that so language has no. Uh, it it needs not have associations that are one to one. That's what it means. Um, discreteness means that there are very, very, like, um, what shall we say, clear-cut rules and clear-cut and well-identifiable rules. Uh, example is you can't say ka and ga at the same time, you know. Even though as a Tamil speaker, I write ka and ga as the same letter, in fact. Um, and that leads to very funny mix-ups when Tamil people speak, say, Hindi or Sanskrit. Because we don't have dirga shabda, we have dirga shabda. Okay, so <laughs> that makes it, or dirga sapta, you know, even that ha can happen. But I can never say the and the at the same time. It's very difficult, try it. Um, so this is a feature of language which allows us to, you know, separate the, uh, the, the shabdhas, right? Separate the, let, the, the phonetics, the sounds. Open-endedness, okay? So I read somewhere in the newspaper that Tamil has 9,000 new words. Yeah, yeah. So, and a minister, release these new words in a public function. Okay, so uh, can someone name a new word? One new word that has recently made it to the English dictionary, sports fans. Yeah? What is the season now? The season of? World Cup. So give me a new word. Yeah? What has been all the buzz about the English team in recent times? Yeah, it's a new word now. So the, the Oxford Dictionary has officially allowed for basketball to be a word. Okay, so two years back, uh, nobody would have recognized what ba basketball was. Now, at least 1.5 billion people know it. <laughs> Who knows if the English know it, but we know it. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that is open-endedness. That is always new additions to a language. Creativity. So I can come up with really absurd. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Has anyone watched that movie? It's a really nice movie. Um, yeah. um, so what does that even mean? It is, it's kind of bordering on meaninglessness, but it can, under the right circumstances, transform into something meaningful. That's creativity where you can push the boundaries of what is understandable, comprehensible, and what is not. Um, duality of uh, structure, I mean, this may not be the best example. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say that if you kept repeating a string of shabdhas, which by itself makes a lot of sense, soon they will lose all sense, okay? Um, it's called, uh, uh, it's called, uh, sort of sentient saturation, right? It, your mind just stops being able to find a meaning. So if you say buffalo, 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 buffalo soon, the, the meaning of buffalo. By the way, this is interesting. Uh, buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. Buffalo the city, uh, buffalo in the city of buffalo. Uh, buffalo, which means to bully. So in the city of buffalo, there's a bully who was bullied by other bullies in the city of Buffalo. So this actually actually makes sense too. But on the other hand, if you keep on repeating that letter, the word, it will stop making any sense. So that's duality of structure. What does that actually mean? It means that something can have meaning and no meaning, sort of simultaneously at the same time. It's very uh, mind-bending. Okay, displacement is the last thing I want to talk about. There are many other things in this list of pockets. Displacement means that you can refer to something that is not right here and now. Uh, like um, <clears throat> children cannot, you know, when very small children, when somebody leaves the room, apparently they think that they're gone. That's it. Okay, that's why children cry when their mom, moms leave because they are convinced that their moms are never going to come back. And they're just so happy. Dogs do that too. You now, if you have a pet, you enter the house, the dog behaves as if he or she hasn't seen you in years. You must have just gone out. 
right? So this is uh, displacement uh, or inability to displace. Language has an inbuilt ability to support displacement. OK, so it's, is that academic enough? <laughs> so now I want to do some music because too much academics. So all you Carnatic kids, do you all know Malkaus or Hindolam? All of you? Great. Who doesn't know Malkaus or Hindolam? Good, you are my audience. Um, Okay, so what I want you to do is um, like treat this as a tutorial. Are the doors locked? No exits. Yeah, um, I want you to sing along just like a couple of minutes, okay? Um, even if you don't sing at all, it doesn't matter. Just try. Um, sa ga ma Da ni sa sa ni da ma ga sa. You're going to do this again but slightly differently. Sa Ga Ma Da Ni Sa Sa the gas the same every time? Okay. Very weird question to ask. Ga That's how we did it in the first trial. Ga Second time. Ga Are they all the same? They're not. They're not, right? I mean, does anyone have any doubt? Um, but I still call them Ga, right? Still call them Ga. Yeah, that's all. Um, so let's do something else. I'm going to sing three notes. You can sing the three notes in any order you want. OK? Sa ga sa Once more Sa ga sa You Yeah, it's so much easier to follow Um how do we randomize? How do we make somebody sing something else? It's actually very difficult, okay? So we are probably, probably solving a tough problem here. Uh, because we don't want to just, you know, stand out in a crowd. It's so much easier to just repeat it. Uh, what are all the possibilities? Sagasa, Sasa Ga, Gagasa. Is Gasaga a possibility? It's not in a way, it is not in a way, maybe it is. Right, I mean, I can push and uh, nudge the boundary and say Gasaga is also okay. 
uh, and then usually my younger students will say sa 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 <laughs> if i give them so much liberty so children tend to push the boundaries the most right uh, we as we grow up we tend to be comfortable not testing the boundaries push the boundaries okay let's uh, let's do some um, uh, crazy single sounds sa so when i went up did i go to sa up there like uh, up sa 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 yeah is that clear sa 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 are they the same notes sa sa okay let's all sing together just that one note no no jumping around just sa 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 okay did we all sing in the same octave or the same like roughly the same levels yes or no no yes okay why yes because we did right we do the same with the shruti box so yeah who says we did not sing the same thing professor raghu you said no right you didn't who said no we didn't sing the same thing professor ashwin yeah are you talking about subtle difference or gross difference subtle difference okay who thinks there are gross differences when we all sang together isn't that a gross difference you don't think so actually it's a very tricky question you know we don't think so but it is <laughs> the 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 pitches are like an octave apart that means two times frequencies right it's like somebody is speaking in very very different tones and naturally in a congregation like this where there are both men and women like where male and female voices are together there will be octaves there will be differences right so we are able to completely ignore those differences and call ourselves singing in the same voice same same pitch okay so this seems like not a big deal but it is actually a very interesting and seemingly innate quality we have this ability to not differentiate uh, between octaves is one of the few things that are not necessarily culturally transmitted huh? we are actually born with the skill so now i can make more cases for uh, skills that are seemingly very musical and uh, only available through musical exposure that we are born with what can we infer from this can we infer anything from this what else is octave useful for i can't think of anything yeah i've done my homework so don't worry <laughs> what does this mean uh, as a musician what would you think what would you like this to mean musicians it's an innate quality in you what does this mean what do you think that what is innate in us come on <laughs> music is innate in us maybe i mean it's very very far fetched no i just give you one example and say that's it yeah but this is way this is the way we build our case as musicians right this is how we we look at nature we look at adaptations we look at ideas in language that says species specificity cultural training uh, i don't know adaptation or uh, Uh, some other specificity or what not and then say start ticking them off one by one by one and then at some point we'll say aha this seems like a language right yeah so i think i want to do that exercise with you now that you're all skilled musicians you can sing malcons at the very least <laughs> um, i mean i mean no belittling those who are actually singers um, and uh, we just want to establish that we are all innately musical right so let's see what is 
long language like formalism i say in indian classical music i should really say in every kind of music right but maybe i can later on make a case for classical indian classical music but like right now right um okay this is actually a slide i want to come up with later after a long sort of alapana and so on but i am going to just ha uh, i want to go here so we saw that laundry list of things in uh, in language so i have questions that you can ponder about hamsa dhvani means the sound of a hamsa so can hamsas actually sing hamsa dhvani no right so it is very specific cultural transmission can you sing a kodava tune without knowing one okay you can't yeah i mean it's the same way that you cannot sing carnatic classical music without at least having heard it so hearing leads you to already culturally get trained right and imbibe it and then think about it and your mind does things unconsciously and you're already trained so the answer is no therefore music is culturally transmitted can we have can do we have the innate ability to identify style so this is the ex, ex, experiment we did we seem to have an innate ability so there is some sort of a specialization either in our heads or our neural networks or in our uh, apparatus uh, maybe because males and females had to say the same things together with the same loudness right so it could be an adaptation that that lets everybody in the species in the tribe just say something very loudly together that right? male and female and that could have lit whatever it is we have specialization that is musical semanticity now that's a tough one because i cannot really say whatever i sing now means something unless there are words to it right if i keep doing ga ma ga sa da ni sa dha ma ga sa ma ga ma ni da da sa da ni ga ni sa da ni sa ga ma ga sa da ga sa da ma ga sa da ni sa what am i saying what do i mean right already people are leaving because they couldn't make sense of it um so in a in a sense like yeah it doesn't seem to make a lot of meaning in the language conventional sense of meaning but are there hidden meanings are there emotional meanings are are there social cohesion meanings are the questions so i am leaving it out as a maybe okay maybe there is semanticity in language we can explore that um is there arbitrariness i think so Uh, because nicha and ucha uh, okay so lower and upper octaves um, we call them lower and upper octaves right why we could have as well called it upper and lower octaves it's like saying the past is here and the uh, no the uh, future is here and the past is there okay so we put the past behind us and the future ahead of us isn't that just an idiom really you can say the other way around right the future is something i can't even see so it should be behind me the past is something i can evidence so it should be in front of me so in the same way i believe that there is a lot of arbitrariness in the structure of music so arbitrariness discreteness <clears throat> i think uh, we all agree that when we did those three gandhara gamakams ga straight note ga gentle mean ga very idiomatic sort of uh, wave they are all different they sound different to us right so we are able to even tell within a note that ga that is there are subtle differences so our ears are able to perceive uh, discrete differences in tone similarly discrete differences in laya or tala uh, and many other angas that we will encounter as we go along so definitely discreteness is a feature um yeah so the question is open endedness are we supportive of open endedness indian classical music um students do you know the melakarta system yes did it fall from the sky no who came up with it there are multiple names you can say any one name hmm Yes, Venkat Amakin is often credited to it. Um, his father and his grandfather and his uh, lineage actually had already came up, uh, come up with it. Venkat Amakin was probably the first to sort of write it in a book. 
um, and so he got the prize for that. Um, but it is a synthetic Raga system, uh, which means we can generate it using mathematics. Okay, and there are so many musical ideas that are mathematically generated, which exist before us, and we'll see some of them as we go along. Um, similarly, we can come up with novel time signatures, you know. Um, so, talas, uh, in Carnatic music, we study a tala system very rigorously. We talk about, um, how many talas? In our uh, so-called alankaram, in Balapata, how many talams are there? Hmm? Seven talas. And how many gati or jatis? How many jatis? Let's say five. Yeah. Tisra, Chatusra, Kanta, Mishra, Sankirna. Right? So there are five jatis. These are just, you know, there, there are actually as many jatis as there are numbers, but we stick to these five jatis and nominally there seems to be seven into five equals thirty-five basic talas. Do you think this is the only tala system there is? No. There are so many other tala systems within orthodox Carnatic music. What about outside of Carnatic music? There are tala systems in Hindustani music. There are tala systems in African music. So there are very many number of tala systems. I have inv invented a tala system. We can actually invent one right after the lecture if you have the time. It doesn't take much. So, you know, synthesis is easy. It's like computer generated, right? We can always synthesize stuff. So that is more than ample proof that Carnatic music, Hindustani music, music, it's open-ended. Creativity is uh, sentences, right? Uh, we, could, we could come up with a lot of musical sentences with just three notes, sa, ga, sa. Actually, just two notes, sa and ga, by doing permutations, combinations. So you can just add more and more notes to it, and suddenly there's an explosion of combinatorial space, right? And here we are not even talking about the, um, you know, certain ragas where it looks different in the ascent and descent. Right, uh, which means there are five notes climbing up and seven notes climbing down. There is a zigzag climbing up and there's a straight come climbing down. We call it vakra raga, you know, um, varja raga, where notes are omitted. So, so many fanciful ways to create um, phrases out of ragas. Okay, so yeah, creativity is uh, amply taken care of. Duality of structure is uh, definitely there because. Um, uh, definitely it's a musical note because I have the Tanpura on. If I didn't have the Tanpura on, it is still a musical note because it is sustaining a frequency for a long time. Outside of that, it may not have actually any musicality to it. It is very contextual. It depends on what I'm doing next. So if I'm singing, Sa it just means it's my last breath. Who knows, right? So, depending on context, a long such a note may be musical or very unmusical. Whereas, in context, the musical note can combine with other musical notes to produce music. Okay, so there is definitely duality of structure and displacement. I don't think music supports displacement because uh, music is in the here and now. It's a great example of staying in the moment. When you make music, you make music. Okay, your mind wanders, sure. You get memories, sure. The raga seems to have emotions, for sure, right? You have associations, um, definitely. You think of some song, some deity, some pleasant memory, sure. But you were thinking might be very different from my thinking. Yeah. So the same Hindolam may be a very pleasant feeling for me and a very unpleasant feeling for you because of prior association. So I feel displacement may not make the list, semanticity may not make the list, but there are other scholars out there that feel maybe we should include them too, to strengthen the case. Net, net, what does this mean? That music is definitely uh, very rich in language-like features. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Should I just go on like this, or uh, do you guys feel like interrupting? Please raise your hand if you feel like interrupting and I'll come to you. So far, no questions. Okay. Okay, this is a nutshell. Okay, some um, 
a, a scholar, a linguist named uh, K. G. Vijay Krishnan came up with this table um, where he has compared. I'll leave the slides behind so that you can take a look if you're interested. Where he has seen language to have certain sort of features and music to have certain features. Math, uh, he has looked at math as a language. Um, he has looked at bees uh, as language because bees, you know, uh, they have very specialized ways of leading other bees to the honey sources. Right? So that's a language. They communicate with each other. What else is a language? Um, sports is a language because um, without even the commentary, you understand what's going on. Isn't that a good enough example? Um, there are boundaries, literally boundaries to the court, rules and uh, regulations on what happens. A lot of creativity in sports, you know, um, uh, and a lot of transmission, everything. Yeah, so I think sports is a bona fide language too. Okay, so I'm going to get into slightly more uh, in-depth territory. I'll, this will probably be the last sort of technical slide, um, but uh, I want to, you know, proceed with uh, doing some more delineations, examples that I can sing and play and show you. Um, and then uh, maybe prior to that, um, let me sing something.
Thank you. That was the Ragam, Atanam, and the Kritana. The, the Kriti or the Kritana, which is the finale here, um, was very deceptive for those who know Carnatic music. You would have, halfway through the rendition, you would have been wondering what I was doing. It takes a long time to establish itself as a Sahitya or a Kriti or a composition. Until then, it could have been easily mistaken for uh, just a set of swaras or notes strung together. Um, it's a very clever piece of uh, Sahitya or, or lyric by my guru, Dr. Bala Murali Krishna. Um, uh, the, the point is that this delineation, the demonstration of a ragam followed by a tanam, followed by a kriti, uh, it, it is actually a living uh, sort of example of many things that we have already spoken and many that we will speak till the cows come home if we had that kind of time because it deals with so many aspects and subtleties of music. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to uh, use this as an example is faith lex or faithful to the lexicon. The lexicon is the dictionary, right? The dictionary of words, phrases, what's allowed, what's not allowed in any language. In the language of Indian classical music, there are there is a lexicon of Sanchari, phrases, usage, um, how a note can be shaken and not stirred, or stirred and not shaken, depending on what character you are, or what personality you are developing. So these are all very, very, very useful things to know if you are inside the language system. Um, <clears throat> so faithful to the lexicon talks up broadly in terms of, in, in, in the raga system, it's gamakams. Ga, look at that. That's ga. That note, which sounds nothing at all like ga, are both ga. So there is a norm, nominal or normative uh, form of the note, and then there is a tradition that dictates how that note has to be used, depending on where it is used. The context is also important. So the lexicon actually this prescribes in terms of context what you should do with the note and the musical phrase and the musical idea where. Uh, whereas the scalar form is the plain form that ga re ga re sa ne sa re ga the same raga that I presented to you called Hanumatodi. If I were to present it scalar, sa re ga ma re sa ne sa da ne sa re ga ma pa da ma pa ga ma pa da ne sa da ne sa re ga re sa re ne sa da ne Okay, uh, what does it sound more like? Any names that come to your mind, uh, those who are into Indian classical music? 
Sarga Padama Padama Re. Okay, I'll give you a phrase that, any Hindustani buffs? Yeah. Sarga Padani Dama Re Ga Padama Ga Pada Sare Gari Nida Sa Sare Ga Sare Nida Ma Padani Dama Re. What is this? What raga is this? It's a beautiful raga. Huh? It's close to Bhairavi. Very good. It's just one, one step remote. Uh, I did uh, deliberately say, It's called Bilashkan Istodi. It even has Todi in its name. I was very happy when I discovered that, aha, finally we agree on names. <laughs> it is Hanma Todi in the south and Bilashkan Istodi in the north. But it's not one to one still. Because I have uh, I have uh, avoided those kind of gama padani garisani risani da ni sani da pama paga. So people who listen to this find it without any prejudice or any prior knowledge of Hindustani or Carnatic music, always find Carnatic harder to listen to, and where hardness is a technical term. Hard as in strict, okay? So there is a stricture, and this goes into the whole discussion on uh, lexical correctness. In, Hindu, in Carnatic music, there is a very, uh, we, are, we are crazy about lexical uh, addi add addition. So one of the great innovations of my uh, Guruji was that he, he kind of drifted very often from the classical lexicon of Carnatic music and he brought a lot of mo lot of interest into the art form, right? So for some that is dilution, for others that is propagation, right? So like any language, <clears throat> if you want to learn Tamil in 30 days, can you uh, on the 31st day write the Tirukural, the greatest poetry in Tamil? You cannot. Even if you studied Tamil for 30 years, you cannot. But if you studied it for 30 days, you cannot write the Tirukural. But you can definitely be able to speak in, in Chennai. No, where the standards are low in Tamil, right? So it is possible for us to learn to an extent. And that itself makes us feel better about ourselves. Who, who has done Duolingo here? Who has used Duolingo to learn language? Isn't it wonderful? OK, so in 20, 30 days, you can at least pick up some basics. You feel good about it. Of course, then you go and watch a movie in, like, say, Korean, and then you don't understand anything with the subtitles. So you haven't learned much, but you've learned something. At least you have learned the alphabet and, and something. So it's not a bad deal to get people into the uh, framework, into the language, into the system. This is what my Guruji did really well. Okay. So um, what are the? So we call this the internal constraints. Inside of the grammar needs no real human interpretation. We understand this as formal uh, uh, prescriptions. Um, external constraints are what is known as patadi gharana style, you know, uh, when you can say this is Gwalia because they do this, this is Agra because they do that, and this is Tanjavur because um, they think a lot of themselves, right? So these are the ways that we can tell from the music itself where they are from. Uh, what is music suited to the medium? <clears throat> it is just that uh, some people have three octaves, some people have five octave voices, some people have very good centered voices, some people can pronounce some sounds. So it is basically what comes as yourself as the medium, what comes with the, with the, with the performance space, uh, with the chamber, the, the audience. So it's kind of external. So uh, here the argument that some um, linguists have is that this grammar, which is basically meaning to sound, the sound being reinterpreted, uh, is not set in stone. But the grammar is constantly shaped by external constraints. And the shaping and chiseling away of the language goes into the lexicon, into the scales, into the modes, and goes to change the language. Uh, so if you are very orthodox, you'll think goes to dilute. If you are very uh, open-minded, you'll say it goes to expand the language. In a similar sense, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples which I think are helping grow the language of classical music in India. Um, okay, so here now I'm going to move on to some uh, 
sort of juicy uh, stuff because now I want to talk about music meeting uh, language, right? Now, uh, now that we have established music as a language, we'll see how music interacts with natural language. Um, this is sort of like a, could say it's a poem um, because I just, I just came up with a way in which we can see the churn of ideas and the symbiosis between music and uh, language, okay? So songs are written, songs are performed, the performances, uh, performance by performance I mean things like you are lulling your baby to sleep, that's a performance. You are in the fields and you're working, that's a performance, right? You are working together, there are, you know, these are all performances because they seem to have a, a, a very interesting outcome on the audiences. So those are performances. Um, and then some collective ideas emerge from the performances um, and they are given names called ragas, metas, patadis, okay. These ragas then go into music and uh, words are invented uh, and, and by these I mean both musical words and language words. They come out of this sort of churn um, and then this goes back, the songs are forgotten, then they are revived. So this is a continuous process, okay. What we see uh, in today's scenario with the shrinking of the world is an acceleration of this phenomenon. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so before we get into the topic of acceleration, a couple of nice musical examples for you. song continues and continues and then we reach a point I'll fast forward to that Shri Guru Gukha Shri Guru Gukha Guru Satchidananda Swarupa Shri Guru Gukha Guru Satchidananda Bhairavam Shiva Shaktyadi Sakala Tattva Swarupa Prakasham Sham Prakasham Swarupa Prakasham Tattva Swarupa Prakasham Sakala Tattva Swarupa Prakasham Shiva Shaktyadi Sakala Tattva Swarupa Prakasham Tyaga Raja Yoga so this is an example where the music and the language meet in very creative ways. And um, I want you to uh, 
see this as a marriage of uh, poetry with uh, equally poetic music. This composer is Muthuswami Dikshitar. And uh, what you saw there is a presentation of two uh, poetic forms uh, known as Gopucha and Shrotavaha. And as you see, the shape of the lyric is, um, in one, one case, it is sort of tapering down. In another, it is broadening. So the first one is called Gopucha because it is like the tail of a cow, broad at the beginning and tapering at the base. That is called Shrotavaha, Shrotaswaha, which is the mouth of a river. Which keeps, uh, which comes very, very narrow in the in the entrance and then broadens towards the mouth. Right? So these are, uh, and there are many, many such. Uh, uh, so many of these yatis are actually ex explored in poetry. In music, the way we explore yati is very different, uh, because music, as you know, is a language of its own. It can do without any of the lyric. Right. So when we practice, we do this sort of meru practice. Get it? So you can keep on going. And what is the advantage, advantage of this practice is that you are always get, getting back to the same root note. Uh, the structures are getting larger and larger, but very manageable, very easy to create. Uh, other thing is that you are gently pushing your voice. So you can go up and higher and higher. So it's a meru. You're building a mountain, and the mountain go as far as your voice can reach on that day. So it's a very good performance uh, a practice tool so that your voice clears out. Um, and, and then you can continue. So there are many such ideas. And similarly, there are uh, mantra merus, where, where you go, sanisa, sanida, nisa, sanida, pada, nisa, sanida, pama, pada, nisa, sanida, pama, pama, pada, nisa. Right? Um, but, uh, but here we don't have any uh, words. It's a very difficult skill to marry the two. So Dikshitar is one of those great composers who kind of merged music with language. Um, a, a similar example, uh, this is Tirugnana um, Sammantar. Um, He's a Shaiva poet. Uh, wrote in uh, Tamil. So he has composed this very interesting song um, called Malay Matral. Um, now, I think he was, he's dated around the third, fourth, fifth century in that uh, region. So very, um, very way back in time before, um, before even some of the major uh, religious movements were established in, in India. Right, such as Shankara and Ramanuja. So he predates them, which means the, the um, language is quite uh, old, right? um, <clears throat> extremely creative. So um, uh, oh, the other thing is that we don't know how he actually sang these things. We know that he sang these. And there is the tradition of temple uh, singers named Oduwars. So they have been singing in temples generation after generation for hundreds of hundreds of years. And they kind of retain the music. This song is not retaining the music of the tradition. It's my tune. Um, but the beauty about the lyric is that it's a palindrome. Um, you know what a palindrome is. It's left to right equals right to left. When you read a, a, a word, um, here it's ya mama ni ya mama, ya, yari kama kanaka, kana kama kariya, mama ya ni mama ya. So those who read Tamil can see that the second line is the reverse of the first line. And both of them carry very different meanings. I mean, related, but different. Um, what I have done here is tune them also like that. It's called Megar Anjani. Ma ya ma ma ni ya ma ma ya di ka ma ka na ka ka na ka ma ka di ya ma ma ya ni ma ma ya 
So this is only three of the stanzas, there are many such stanzas. So the entire the entire Male Matral consists of ten such songs. Each of one each one of them that is a palindrome of the previous line. So um, so this is an idea of where music meets language or music is inspired by language. Uh, the language is a palindrome, the music is a palindrome. The only thing is that in music you are looking for meaning, you are hunting. Even if you don't understand Tamil, you are wondering what could it possibly mean in the other directions. You may even have picked a few uh, words here and there. Uh, but in music there is no such pressure. Okay? So in terms of constraints, music is uh, less constrained than language, uh, natural language. So that's another case for music as a universal language. Okay, so here is an example of music within language. Uh, in poetry, that's called prosody, or even in linguistics, which means that when we speak, we speak in a music. So uh, they say Italian is the, uh, uh, they, uh, I mean, Europeans say, uh, um, what does it say? Telugu is the Italian of India. You know, that's a phrase like that. Indians say it, India, Italian is the Telugu of Europe. Um, so the, what, are, what are we referring to? We are referring to the musicality of the language. This is an example which, um, let's, see, uh, let's see if this comes up and it plays. If not, I'll give you a link. Okay, so I'll give you the idea behind the experiment. You take a word, you take a phrase, a small phrase, and then loop it, okay? And just let it loop and loop exactly the same phrase. Now, not only will the loop kind of lose meaning like it did when we were saying buffalo, buffalo, but it'll actually sound like a song. It'll literally sound like it has been tuned, okay? And you can do this randomly. So I did this in class. I made a little kid say something, recorded it, and then looped it. Um, so you can do it to yourself if you are that curious or that jobless. Uh, but there is a great insight behind it, that there is prosody in language, there is music in inside language, and therefore uh, there is an emergence of music in our everyday lives that we don't even notice. Right? Uh, that means there is pitch, pitch boundaries, there is uh, there is actually tunes that you can relate to, a lot of other things, okay. So the other application of music, which I will, you know, just present anyway, because this seems to be relevant in Chanakya, because ideals to ideas, I had a slide which said ideas to ideals and uh, coincidence. So I, I think of this as ideas. When you're outside, automobiles, chatter, music, occasional silence, birds, sirens, this is just city life in India. Um, and they have resonances in your mind that are echoes and memories, perceptions, judgments. And these have a second resonance, which can be fantasies and thoughts and words. And they lead to sonic ideals. What really this is, is that I'm sitting in the middle of a busy junction and playing music. And the music that I play is actually inspired by this randomness around me. Okay, except that I have just tried to break down the process that goes into the making of the music. So I have used, um, so this I call interpreting reality through music, 
Um, and uh, somebody actually has composed something for it, which the composition itself I won't play. But these are literally the sort of prompts that the composer Julio Estrada suggests when you play his music. So what he wants you to do is to assemble as musicians around something that he creates, and he calls these uh, prompts as part of the composition. So it is music. Imagine an echo of something, what you hear. Discover silence. And all that should be prompting you to create music. Okay. Here we are using music uh, language as an accelerator or as a, as a uh, prompt or you know, as an idea to inspire the ideal of music. And I call music an ideal because like mathematics, music is a universal sort of language. It, it is as close to an idealized language as it gets. Okay, so the final sort of um, slide I have here is sort of futuristic directions. I'm not going to call it future directions because a lot of it has already happened. Uh, um, so these are things that are happening as we speak. More synthetic ragas, more um, math-inspired ragas. Um, a lot of, uh, we were talking about A.R. Rahman during lunch. Um, um, preceding him was A.R. Uh, Ilai Raja, uh, Venkatesh, uh, Salil Chaudhary, um, the Bollywood greats of Esther years. Um, before that was Tyagaraja, who, and Muthuswami Dikshita. They all had Western-influenced ideas in their compositions. So um, those are all uh, language contact. Basically, language is musical language. We make contact, and of course, we change. Um, On-demand services are actually leading to democratization. You can hear anybody at any time through Spotify or YouTube. There is a convergence of tonal perception. Now, this is something that uh, is a purist's dismay, because this means soon you will not be able to even tell those gamakams, the, the subtleties in notes, the microtones the frequencies, because the world is converging around popular music. So everything is uh, one or the other mode. There is major and there's minor, right? So in a, in a world, in a, in a uh, country where there are thousands of ragas, and many of the ragas have uh, actually um, personalities. Ragas and raginis are supposed to be living and breathing creatures. If we divide this entire world of music into happy and sad, or major and minor, that's something wrong, right? That's a problem. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we have a medium now through this uh, democratization of music by which we can push a lot of these ideas out. Okay. So do we have to make some uh, uh, sacrifices? Do we have to cut some corners here and there? Uh, maybe yes. Um, um, so some of the... Some of the things that are happening now, just as there is trend uh, in India towards uh, local healing methods, Ayurveda, for example, and it's showing up in lots of places where people are intervening in health. So this is sort of like, um, this is happening in music too. Now there is actually a lot of people who enjoy pristine music or traditional music, uh, realize that this is very hard. You cannot simply get to it by, um, by, by just you know, um, not working to it. it. It requires work. And guess what? People seem to enjoy working hard. Yeah. And that's actually a global reality. So better get used to enjoying, uh, working hard and enjoying it. Okay. And disruptions through AI. Um, definitely, you know, the world of music is going to be disrupted, is already being disrupted. And so will the world of classical music. We don't know how fully. So in linguistic terms, we are relaxing lexical constraints. Okay. Um, so in the spirit of relaxing lexical constraints, I thought I would play something for you as a sort of a last uh, a piece on the saxophone, because the saxophone um, represents modernity. You know, it's an old instrument, uh, actually. If you think about it, it's been around for over 100 years, and 120, 30 years. But uh, till date, um, the entrance of a saxophone in, in imagery and in sonic imagery usually brings an emotion of uh, modernism, okay? So 
So I'm going to play some saxophone for you. That was a Devarnama, actually. Enu Maadi the Renu, and popularized by my Guruji. And uh, what raga was it? Okay, so we can have some Q&A if you want to be that formal about it and talk to me like this, or I will just walk amongst you and collect your questions. Is there a way to do this uh, formally? Do you have a process? You have mics floating around. Just put up your hands. If you have any questions, yes. So thank you for the wonderful afternoon. Uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, Sound of Music, the movie. You're too young, but you must have seen the movie. Of course. Sir. And uh, you know the song, uh, Do Re Mi. Do Re Mi. So part of it goes, uh, you can sing anything. Right. 
But I've always been puzzled, and I want to ask a professional like you, when they are referring to that scale, they cannot sing Carnatic music, whether it's gamakas. So it's a false claim, isn't it? And is it something that you have touched on at the end? What do you mean by you can sing anything? Yeah, I think it's a, um, it's a cultural claim. It's cultural uh, in the sense that it is definitely a Western claim. It's centered in the world of uh, European tradition. Uh, even within that tradition, let's see the movie, right? The movie is about Maria von Weber um, trying to educate a group of rowdy children uh, into many things, but chiefly music. That's why it's called Sound of Music. And then uh, she uh, finally realizes that uh, the best leverage she has over the children is to allow them to play using music, right? And so she uncovers that musicality in them. Uh, so like we have Maya Malava Gaula in our uh, tradition, uh, they have this uh, Western, Western uh, the, the major uh, mode. Um, she sings, you can sing most everything. I think she means almost everything. Almost, almost everything. Okay. So that oh leaves God. you, you know, some wiggle space, which is almost everything else. Cannot be sung, but uh, you know, that won't make a good song. When, when you want to sell something, you want to sell it as it can open any, any lock. <laughs> so I think, of course, it is a fallacy, uh, but it's a poetic fallacy. So I think it's OK. Uh, so uh, does it touch on your last point that uh, our gamakas and so on are not, uh, they are in danger or some such thing? Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, gamakam, uh, the, the framework of gamaka is a peculiar Indian uh, feature. And uh, there are many theories around how it actually happened to be. One theory is that language influenced uh, music. Therefore, the gamakams tend to, you know, the southern Indian way of doing gamakams is influenced by Telugu and Tamil and Kannada and uh, so on, whereas the northern is influenced by late uh, either, you know, uh, Prakriti languages there in like Hindi or Persian. And uh, so the bends and the curves of the music also imitate the language and, and vice versa. We don't know which, which came first. You know, so one claim that I, I, do, I can say I don't know for sure is what came first? Was it language or was it music? So depending on which researcher you look at, they make claims to support their uh, worldview, right? So um, <clears throat> in terms of Western music, now is Western music devoid of gamakam? No, it is not, right? But what has happened in Western music is the industrialization of the music. Uh, when you add a, a 50 musicians into an orchestra, then can we all agree on something? The only thing we can agree on is to play the notes straight. You know, this is a, you know, you can only stick to one thing, which is a scalar form of the m music. The the vector or the uh, idiomatic form is going to be the uh, victim when you have uh, so many people working together. It's basically the difference between, uh, I would say, um, uh, handmade art and industrially printed uh, art. Right. So in, in a way, industrially printed art is great because it, you can access, more people can access it. In a similar sense, I would say, no, I, I mean, it's a dangerous statement to say that Western music is, uh, it's just simplistic and it is mass churned. That's also not true, but their focus is different. They want to be able to perform in a symphony with exact uh, sort of uh, um, uh, fidelity with respect to what is on the sheet. Whereas the Indian music, Indian musicians' uh, goal with the art is entirely different. The goal, uh, uh, the communal goal of Indian music is to involve others. Bhajana is really the goal, or, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, sung, uh, satsang is the important thing, where not only do you sing, but you also make others sing. Um, so that, I think, is a very different uh, goal. Um, and there is really no need when you have uh, like uh, so much flexibility uh, for each note to be you know exactly hitting the same uh, 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 micro frequency at the same time. So yeah, I think that is basically what it is. Are, uh, any other questions? Carnatic kids.
Anything from the students? Um, or should I ask you questions based on what I? <laughs> I know it's not very difficult for you, but uh, I could still ask. Hi, sir. First of all, thank you so much for this enlightening session. Uh, so basically, I do not have much idea about Carnatic music, but coming from a field of Western classical music, I would like to ask you regarding how do we bring about a balance between this particular lexical constraints and the emerging trend of uh, improvisation? So how do we control this? Or how do we bring about the balance? Yeah, OK. So by, by the way, I mean, you brought up improvisation. Improvisation is actually very fundamental to Indian music. Right? Uh, it is not at all a big deal in Western uh, um, or European music. It's a big deal in American music. Right? So here you see a spectrum uh, depending on where you are a practitioner of Western music. Uh, if you are a practitioner of jazz, then improvisation becomes a very, very important piece uh, of the puzzle for you. Uh, but the lexicon of uh, uh, phrases in jazz is very different. Okay, how do you, uh, let's take jazz because it, it lets in, li, lends itself to improvisation like Carnatic music does and Hindustani music does. In jazz, uh, depending on which period of jazz you're playing, uh, you are either going to be a, a bop improviser, a scat improviser, um, a, a, a modal improviser, or a freeform improviser. Now there's also an acid improviser, okay. And then it's a postmodern improviser. So now, what, is, what are all these terms? You know, they are basically recent inventions. Uh, they are usually uh, invented by one or two people, just like our gharanas were invented by one or two people who went and settled in those places and created their own flavors. So uh, even though jazz is a recent lexicon, just about 100 years old, uh, it, you can see that the, the narrative of jazz has changed from being a music that is confined uh, to the edges of society because it's improvisational, people do crazy things. Um, jazz actually also had a, a slang meaning saying uh, improper conduct. You know? So it actually had a, a moral uh, negative connotation. From there, Today, jazz is considered the greatest thing that America ever exported to the world. Right? Um, so it's come a long way. It has become classical in a way. Right? So uh, I think maybe you know, instead of worrying too much about are we going to be lexically faithful, I think we should uh, worry about um, um, which parts of uh, the lexicon evolve in which ways by just looking at evolution. So uh, also Carnatic music, right, in the 18th and 19th century had a major revival of sorts because of the, the modern trinity of Carnatic music. Tyagaraja and Dikshitar and Shama Sastri and those composers basically created a revival of sorts, right? So suddenly there were new uh, ragas that came out of nowhere, uh, you know, mostly from books and theories. Um, so suddenly in the 19th century, uh, uh, the whole place was ringing with a new kind of sound of music, right? Um, so if it is possible to re-energize a, a sort of a dying art, um, and it was done 150 years ago, why can't it be done again, right? And did they even have recordings? They, they had nothing. They had books and some traditions. That was it, right? But they could just light a fire then. So um, I think our challenge is to keep the fire lit on one hand, and, and lighting new fires where we can. So the balance that you're talking about is uh, going to only be possible if you first have a conflagration, which means you take everything and just burn, right? And then what's left is balance. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for the talk, sir. So can you please elaborate on uh, disruptions through AI? What do you think? Uh, are possible disruptions through AI which can happen in future? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So we have a lot of positive and negative press about AI. Uh, it's being already dubbed as the most disruptive technology, more dangerous than nuclear fission. You know, all sorts of things are being uh, ascribed to AI. Um, you know, and I'm sure all of you has have used um, ChatGPT and Dali and Bard and. Uh, whatever else. There are also 
musical equivalents of these things, right? How, how many of you have es uh, explored those music servers in Discord where you can write um, a song and throw it in and it'll, it'll produce and give it back to you? Yeah? Uh, if you haven't, you should try it. Uh, um, there, are, there are ways, I mean, it won't sound great, honestly. It's still very nascent. Uh, but there's a way to, uh, by which you can say, I want a pop contemporary style of music and I want, uh, it could even write the lyrics for you. You could say, I want a birthday party song for my kid. And it will always come up with a unique uh, song, right? Uh, and they all will sound the same. So the word unique uh, has a great new meaning uh, thanks to AI. Because basically underlying, underlying AI is, is what? Data, right? And underlying data is what? Biases, right? So what do you think the today's AI is biased towards? Uh, Anglo-speaking, Western-oriented uh, set of data. Okay, where is the Indianness to that? Okay, so this is what we can do, and I mean, uh, we are actually doing, some of us, uh, is to create uh, enough data sets to challenge the, the biases that are existing. Create our own biases. I mean, let's be open about it, right? If a bunch of Indians get together, it'll start smelling like curry, right? And that's great, because that's what we eat, right? So let's say, uh, I would say, you know, what's going to happen in, to, in AI is rather than uh, nuclear fission, it's going to be AI fission, which means AI is going to become local AI. A lot with more availability, uh, with more powerful algorithms, with more computing power, we will be able to create an AI that addresses Chanakya, you know, the needs of uh, the community of learners in Chanakya, right? That will uniquely serve, be uniquely biased towards, be uniquely beneficial also uh, to not, not, I mean, in general, everything, but also to the musical taste of this uh, particular society, right? So I think, you know, uh, in an ideal world, AI will converge into us and produce a, a better species, right? And I think, you know, the music, uh, when Indian music gets into the sort of AI seeding and AI coding, it is going to make the world a better place. I mean, yeah, because, Thank you. Yeah, it'll remove the biases, that's all. Okay, we are done. Thank you very much.